and welcome to Unplanned, the show about cities and how they work. I'm Sam, your host, and today we have the great pleasure of talking with Wendell Joseph, who's an urban planner, uh, currently working at Sasaki, formerly worked at the city of Cambridge. Uh, and we're going to dive right into the issues of race, of policing, of planning, of all of the issues that are really on our minds right now in America. Uh, I'm thr thrilled to have Wendell with us today. Uh, and before we start the conversation, let me remind you to subscribe to Unplanned. We're going to have plenty more interesting conversations in the future. But without further ado, Wendell, thank you for joining us on Unplanned. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're an urban planner. What else? How'd you get into planning, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, like a lot of planners, um, I ended up in planning through architecture. So um, when I first started uh, my college years, I, I majored in architecture. Um, and it was during that process that um, you know, I was exposed to a much broader way of, of thinking about the built environment, um, you know, moving beyond just the building on a site to, you know, many buildings, many sites, you know, a block, a neighborhood, a community, a city. Um, and, you know, that really, really, really caught my interest. I mean, I did finish my architecture uh, studies. I graduated my uh, MARC back in 2011. Um, but at the time, so what, what I had planned to do was, by the time I graduated from my MRC, I knew that I wanted to go into planning. I didn't know what urban planning was just yet, but I knew that that's the direction I wanted to go in. So I figured, okay, I'll go out, I'll work as an architect for a little bit or in an architect's office and then, you know, just go back to school when I'm ready and, and, and pursue planning. Um, but again, 2011, mid-recession, nobody's hiring entry-level architects. Um, so, you know, the times being what they were, I just ended up going back to school shortly afterwards um, and in 2013, I started my uh, urban planning uh, graduate program at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, and that's kind of like how I, I got into it. The first job that I'm aware of uh, that you were working at, and that's kind of how we got to know each other a little bit, was through your work at the city of Cambridge here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, Cambridge is a very progressive city. It, it spends a lot of time and a lot of, frankly, resources on, ur on planning. Um, what, and we've both interacted with the city and the city government on that. What's been your, what was your perspective on that whole experience in a city like Cambridge? Yeah, I mean, you know, in a lot of ways, it was, you know, a huge, um, you know, uh, blessing to be able to start my planning career at Cambridge, a city that does have, you know, a great deal of resources at its disposal that it can kind of like mobilize in a lot of different ways. And, you know, to, to be in a place like Cambridge as a planner, again, you have um, you know, opportunities to do some projects or you know, have certain kind of conversations that maybe you might not be able to have um, in other cities that may not have, have as much resources or, or just you know, a citizen base that is incredibly uh, knowledgeable um, and active um, and passionate about uh, not just what goes on in their communities, but like what the city itself is doing about it and has to say about it. I want to use that experience of Cambridge to, uh, if, if we can, to, to begin to talk about um, race, race in America, race in urban planning, uh, which mm -hmm. is a very important, but sometimes not always talked about, at least in direct terms, uh, issue that, that comes up. Uh, sometimes it takes other names or other guises, access, equity. Um, I, these are has been very challenging times in America, uh, no question. And I, I just wanted to start to get your thoughts of, of your own perception of kind of where we're at and what that means for an urban planner, for somebody who has to think about uh, how we put spaces together for common use. Yeah, that's a... Uh you know, an expansive question. I mean, I, it's something that I've been thinking about since I, since I got into planning, since my journey in planning started. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the more that you, the more you're in this industry, the more you learn. My um, engagement with that topic of the intersection of race and planning or race and space has continued to, you know, evolve and change over the years. Um, I've, you know, I thought about it um, from a more personal point of view of like, how do I, as a black man and a planner, do this work? Right? I mean, the two are not separate. 
you know, I, I bring my whole self into the work that I do. Um, but because of the work that I do, like I, I understand space in a certain kind of way, in a context, um, and the history of space and all that is that 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 it entails. Um, and so, you know, obviously race and racism and, and structural systemic racism specifically is a, a huge part of that. So that was something that I had to struggle with for a long time. I think it's something that you know, I will continue to struggle with because um, again, I don't, I'm not going to stop being black um, even as I continue in planning. And so it's, it's, um, it is a personal as much as it is a professional um, struggle. So can that's, you, can that, you give us some insights yeah. as to how, like a, almost by, by example, maybe about how it informs your approach or your thought or your thought process? My mm -hmm. own, my own thought now is that, you know, one of the issues or challenges for us all is just to become more aware of who we are and how we think about things and how we approach things. I'm curious yeah. what your own insights are about how you approach some of these issues. For me, you know, the, 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 the tension, the conflict was in realizing that, you know, the built environment by design um, is fairly hostile to people to different people in different ways um the built environment is fundamentally um inequitable because the built environment is a reflection of our values and our values are fundamentally inequitable right so that's where the the legacy and the history of racism and slavery and all that kind of stuff come into play right those are what form the values of this country and those values are represented in the built environment so there's no surprise that somebody who looks like me is immediately and um, um, immediately perceived to be a threat or you know a hostile um, um, individual and so in recognizing that this is how the built environment was designed to be and recognizing that now i am somebody whose work is in the built environment um on on, on, a, on a on a significant aspect of society that is hostile to people, to different people. It's like, well, what does that mean? How, how do I then engage in this work in a way that I can try to push for projects and plans or just discourse or ideology or philosophy around planning that continues to be anti-X or anti-Y, um, anti-hostile or anti, um, you know, uh, a threatening against people for different reasons. And it's not, race is the big piece, right? Race, race is the big one, but it's not just race, right? I mean, the built environment is- No, I agree. I agree with you. And I want to let you continue this thought. people of different genders, of sexual relations. Yeah. Let me, let me just jump in very quickly. I, I agree that race is by no means the only issue. Uh, money, uh, wealth, age uh, are some other factors exactly. that almost always play in. Planning is often- viewed as a, um, a sort of almost a passive enterprise these days. Mm. The, the bold plans almost don't exist anymore. And it's often uh, the planners try to deal with the conflicts at the edges and then the big negotiations happen at a political level. How do we go forward in this process uh, to start to address some of the issues you're identifying? Um, for one, you need a, a, to acknowledge that the this is a major issue, right? That basically governs, you know, how we think about and design and structure um, the built environment. And and to the extent that you acknowledge that it's a problem, then you have to be actively engaged in countering that um, with um, the right kind of policies or projects or whatever that are anti-blank. Um, in in this case, you know, anti anti-racist. Um, again, this is the value system that we're dealing with, and so it's the default setting. Um, and if we're not actively aware and engaged in being anti-racist or being anti-whatever in the built environment, it's easy to slip back into default setting. Before you know it, something happens like, oh my gosh, how can we, you know, the unintended consequences, right? Those are the, That's like the term that we are familiar with in planning, where you do something and you expect, you know, these kind of things to pan out, but then something else, well, these are unintended consequences. And I mean, that's always going to be a thing, 
I'm in planning, but I think, again, being aware and, and naming and being courageous enough to name that this is an issue. And so because it is an issue, this plan is trying its best to, in its own way, um, not be part of the problem, but try to be part of the solution. And, and you know, those things kind of like um, scale up over time. I think another, another uh, piece I would add to that in terms of planning is, again, is how you do something is as much as important as what you're trying to do, um, as well as why you're trying to do it. So the how, I think, is really about thinking through the process of planning and, and, and who is part of that conversation and how their voices are amplified or how the perspective is amplified. What is one suggestion you would make to the planning profession in general or to your planning colleagues more specifically of here's something we can try in the weeks and months and years ahead that might help? Um, that's a you know, good question. I think, you know, it, it, I kind of touched on it a little early in our conversation. You know, we, we bring our whole selves into our profession. Um, and so I think the, you know, probably the best, most important thing I could share with my fellow planners is how you engage with these topics and your understanding of these topics and these issues is incredibly important. Um, and again, it's not about being an expert. It's not about mastering these different things, but understanding, having a fundamental understanding of these different issues and their, and how they play out in space, right? Racism, how does that play out in space? You know, sexism or ableism, how does that play in space? Um, you know, uh, wealth disparities, how does that play out in space? Um, paying close attention to the world around us, but also the history that um, precedes us, um, that has brought us to this point in time, I think makes us better planners because um, it, it, it deepens our literacy of space and of people and how the two come together. Um, space is not an abstract thing. I mean, this is real and people are a part of it, right? I mean, what's the point of being a planner if we're designing and building cities and communities that people don't live in, right? I mean, people are a fundamental component of the built environment and of the work that we do. And so to the extent that people are such a dynamic um, factor of the built environment, then being able to engage in the history of people and both good and bad, I think is important in in enhancing our literacy and you know putting us in a better position to try to apply um, anti whatever uh, frameworks in the work that we do. So you're a younger generation than me uh, by <laughs> years. I, I'm not sure how many, but um, uh, as you look forward in your own life and the the communities you work in and the country you live in, are you hopeful? Are you worried? Where are you on that scale? Um, There, there are reasons to have hope. Um, I don't typically consider myself a hopeful person, um, mainly because, you know, his, historical precedents. I mean, we've been in this fight for a, a long, long, long time. And there certainly has, um, there's, we've certainly seen some progress. Um, you know, I'm not going to act like, you know, it's just been a whole loss. I mean, there's, been a ton of ton of progress, but in as much progress as there is, there's almost twice as much work to do. Even though I'm, I don't consider myself to be a hopeful person, I also am not one to say something's not possible. Anything is possible, um, and you know I hope that you know I'm able to be part of something miraculous that is able to happen in our lifetimes that I didn't see coming, and that I can say, you know what. I'm glad I was wrong, but I'm also glad that I'm here to see this happen and that I could be a part of it, yeah, along yeah. with a whole bunch of other folks. Sometimes you go into a community meeting, say, and there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of uh, emotion, uh, but maybe there hasn't been as much time spending time with the actual data and what's, uh, I hate to say it, uh, as a planner, this is sometimes my view, uh, what's really possible. Now, at the same time, you do have to push hard. You, the, the world doesn't change unless you push, but. Uh, but there is a reality out there, you know, a, a curbstone does weigh a lot of, of weight. And if you want to rip it out, that's going to take some effort. Um, yeah. and, you uh, know, I, it, it, I'm glad you made that point. Cause I think it's, it's very, very interesting. It's planning is really about what's possible. And I think 
people's ability to engage in the possibility is also is in a lot of ways a form of privilege. Um, and here, here's what I mean by that is as planners, we have the privilege of having certain, you know, set of knowledge, uh, skills and knowledge and expertise, education. So we're able to like do projections and scenarios and like, I mean, this is our job is to think of what's possible. And that's a certain kind of privilege. When you think about communities though, being able to think that far ahead is largely informed by your lived experience on a day-to-day -day basis. If I'm an individual living in a community where resources are tight and I don't know what's gonna happen in the next day, let alone the next five minutes, if we're talking about five to 10 years, 30 years, I like I can't, I don't have the capacity to do that because I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. If I'm an individual living in a community with an abundance of resources, where I'm not worried about tomorrow or next week or next month, the next year, sure, let's think about the next 10 years. That sounds like fun, you know what I mean? Um, so the, the, the capacity to think about the possibility of the future, I think is, a, is a, a function of privilege and it makes our job as planners complicated sometimes because you don't know what kind of community you're gonna be walking into and people's capacity to engage in that thought process of, hey, what might this look like 10 years from now? You know, but I, I, I think that's a profound, I, I think that's a profound uh, observation and I, an insight into not in, into both the, the community world of different communities, but also the planners world of what they need to bring into a, any meeting that they go into. It made me think, you, you think about communities where resources are tight and we've all interacted with those and we know, we know them. Uh, and then you go out to a town like Lincoln, Massachusetts, where they have land that they set aside 80 or 100 years ago, and they want to do a plan for the next 100 years. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just different worlds. Yeah. It's different worlds, and the planner has to be able yeah. to engage. Yeah. And also, I would say, you know, balance, look for the equity piece. I, you know, MAPC spends a lot of time talking about equity. It, it's a lot harder to figure out how you get there in real terms, I think, um, given those divergent, those different worlds. Uh, mm -hmm. What would be your suggestion? I'm curious what your, you've made a, a great insight, but what, what's your recommendation or your thought, your next thought after that? Regarding- Well, about or? how does a planner deal with those, that reality that you've identified? How does a planner- Yeah. I process that fact, yeah. those facts. I think, I think planners, good planners are flexible, good planners improvise. The, our training gives us the tools that we need to be able to solve some pretty complex problems, but they cannot be tools that are so rigid that they're not moved and informed by local context, both current and historical. Um, and so you really gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be light on your toes. You know, you gotta be light on your toes and just, it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, delicate, delicate dance. And so I would, I would say that you wanna be the kind of planner where you, you already know, you have, you have your tools, but when you walk into a community, um, that you haven't been in before, you know, there's, you know, maybe, okay, you might've done some reading and some groundwork before, but there's still some things that you won't know until you get in there, that you will allow what you're hearing to be able to move you in a way that you respond in, in an appropriate way. I think the, the best kind of planning processes are ones that really find that sweet spot between expertise and experience. And our expertise can't be so rigid that we're not able to move as is necessary by experience. Um, so you really gotta be, you know, you gotta be light on your feet, light on your toes, and just kind of like go with it. Um, and and allow what and allow and allow yourself to be pushed in, in into places that you haven't been to before by the people who are living in that area. Um, again, we have the tools, we have the tools. Um, we have what we need to be able to like figure some stuff out. So allow yourself to bend as is necessary um, to be able to, you know, be of, of service to these different communities. 
So yeah, be flexible and, and improvise and be okay with that. Be okay with being uncomfortable. Wendell, I think you've uh, shared with us some very profound insights and also some of your own personal story and uh, both have been wonderful to hear about and to learn about. And I, I just want to take this opportunity just to thank you for spending a little bit of time with us on Unplanned. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, again, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts um, and I appreciate you uh, reaching out and uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, great conversation. Thank you.